Okay. This is great. Thank you so much, Peter, and um, thanks to The Strand for hosting this event, as well as uh, thanks to uh, all the great folks at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt who helped set it up, too. And thanks to all of you uh, for being here today, as well as uh, thanks, of course, to our panelists for joining us. Um, so uh, I, I feel very fortunate. This is the third uh, volume of Best American Comics that I've worked on as series editor every year. We've had a nice... Uh, launch event uh, at the Strand. This is actually the first time I've been able to um, have the person who I collaborated with as the guest editor here at the launch event, which is very exciting. And uh, as we were trying to decide what we should do for the panel, um, uh, my idea was that it would be great to have three people who had never been in Best American Comics before, um, because I think there are a lot of different things that are great about Best American Comics, but one of them is the possibility of discovery, finding uh, maybe new authors uh, who you hadn't um, necessarily known about before. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do today is to talk just a little bit about the book in general, to talk to Roz a little bit about the last year that we spent reading a billion comics. And um, I'd like to also talk a little bit to each of the contributors we have here, um, both so you can get a little bit of a sense of what their work is like overall, and then also about the particular pieces that they have in the book. Um, so first, just to very briefly explain um, what Best American Comics is and how it works. Um, uh, I, I hope for the reader it's like this magical experience where once a year uh, the, the comics elves drop an amazing anthology of great comics uh, that maybe you haven't seen before. Um, but from our end of the process, um, the way that it works is kind of governed by the fact that Best American part, Comics is part of the broader Best American series of titles published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Um, these are uh, all annual books that come out every year. I think there are about a dozen titles in the series. Um, the first and oldest one is Best American Short Stories, and that's been coming out since I think 1915. So it's like a you know century-old institution, a book that comes out every year, anthologizing a selection of outstanding short fiction from the previous year. And then there are many other volumes, the Best American Essays, Best American Travel Writing, uh, Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, and so forth. So Best American Comics is one of a number of these series that comes out every year. This is the 10th anniversary of Best American Comics. The first one came out in 2006. And um, the book works in very much the same way as the other Best American titles in that um, we have a we have a totally open submission process. Anyone can submit their work to Best American Comics, and the same is true of Best American Short Stories, uh, et cetera. Um, my role as series editor is to receive and look at all of the submissions that come in and take them seriously. Um, and you know, because it's wide open, as it should be, that means that we get everything from books by well-known authors, published by big publishing houses, to uh, handmade, photocopied, stapled zines by people who maybe you've never heard of before, but who in some cases are doing exceptional work, and we look at that all equally. Um, beyond that, I also spend a fair bit of time going to comic book festivals, going to comic book stores, looking online, scrolling through Tumblr, uh, talking to trusted colleagues uh, who sometimes can be very helpful at, at uh, letting me know about something I've never heard of before. Um, so anyway, in the process of all of this activity, I get, um, I receive approximately uh, 15 bazillion comics uh, that all show up at my apartment uh, that I get to wade through. Uh, and I look at them, and um, I read them, and I take them all seriously in what I hope is an open-minded way, uh, but at the same time also trying to uh, apply some critical judgment to the work. And what I do is I boil it down to a pool of about 120 or so pieces that I then forward to the guest editor. And all of the Best American titles each year have a special guest editor who's an acknowledged uh, expert or credible voice in the field who comes in, looks at the pool of work selected by the series editor, and then makes the final choices 
as to what goes into the book. Um, and that has the value, I think, of keeping the book fresh. Um, I think what it also does is it is a way of pointing out that, yes, of course, uh, we call these books best, but best is subjective. So let's make a strength of that by bringing in a different subjectivity every year. And I think also, you know, we've been very lucky. We've had great guest editors. Even in my tenure, I've worked with Scott McCloud, Jonathan Lethem, uh, now Roz. And I think it's interesting every year to see um, those individuals' takes on the field as they see it in that year. Um, and so this year, I worked uh, with Roz. And it's funny, because from my point of view, I feel like I um, process uh, an overwhelming volume of material. And by the time I get it down to the selections that I send to the guest editor, it feels very contained to me. Like it's 120 or 230 pieces, but to me it feels like, by comparison to the much bigger pool of work I've looked at, it feels like this cute little bouquet of material that I'm sending over to the guest editor. But realistically, I know from the other side, if going from nothing to you know 130 comics showing up at your doorstep, that's actually uh, a smaller avalanche, but still an avalanche. Uh, Roz sent me this picture at one point in our process of uh, a bunch of submissions spread out all over her <laughs> floor in her house in Connecticut. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Roz, what it is like to get all of that stuff, maybe sometimes by people you've heard of before, but in many cases by people who whose work you hadn't seen before, what it's, like, what it's like to have that show up on your doorstep and have to process it all? Well, it's, it is, it's definitely uh, an overwhelming um, amount of things to go, number of things to go through. Uh, I mean, it did not seem like this cute little bouquet <laughs> <laughs> to me. It came in four boxes of about 30, 35 uh, different pieces each. And um, some of them were large books like this done by, you know, well-known people. Uh, some of them were anthologies uh, where Bill had marked a couple of, you know, with post-its, you know, this is the piece that I'm considering. Some of them were stapled together zines. Um, and it was extremely overwhelming for me, I think also because, uh, you know, um, I... I draw cartoons, but I don't consider myself in any way um, or an expert in this field of graphic memoirs or graphic novels, you know. And there are some big names I had heard of, of course, you know, Alison Bechdel and Chris Ware and uh, Adrian Tomine. Um, uh, but there were many, many people that I felt I should know this person's work, but duh, I don't, because I'm an idiot. And, uh, um, you know, so there was that aspect to consider also. And, and then just thinking, you know, because I don't know that much about it, how am I going to make these decisions of, like, who should be included in this and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it was sort of like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, it's kind of interesting, because, it, it, like, the, for the 2015 volume, you were in it, um, and I was working with Jonathan Lethem as the guest editor. And in some ways, like Jonathan is someone who, in, in many ways, is a real outsider. He's mainly a novelist, but he does know a lot about comics. So it was really interesting to have his take, and he included your work. And it, because you did this long-form book, this like graphic memoir, it kind of feels like, oh, all of a sudden you're in the comics <laughs> club because you did a graphic memoir. Well, I, th I think one thing about whatever kind of cartoons you do, whether you do uh, graphic novels or graphic memoirs, or what I do and what Liana you know, does for The New Yorker, which is more like not necessarily single panel gags, but you know, gag cartoons as opposed to you know, a lot more long form thing, um, you're still dealing with what I think of as the most amazing and most wonderful thing about cartoons and comics in that is that they combine words and pictures, so and that and they use this that both of those things to tell a story. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one of the things about your work too, actually, is looking at um, your work that you've produced, uh, you know, for a while now for the New Yorker and in other places. You've always kind of mixed formats anyway. Like one book of yours that I like a lot uh, is Mondo Boxo. And that's like another, that's not a page from Mondo Boxo, but that's another page. I mean, Mondo Boxo to me is like a comic book. It's just because it's all yeah. like 
sort of, you know, it's funny they call it cartoon stories, but it could have been comics by Roz Chast. So you've always kind of gone from like single panel to yeah. sequence, the different kinds of things. I have a very short attention span and I get bored doing the same thing over and over. So I like to experiment with different ways of doing it, you know, whether it's a single panel or three or a longer story and, um, you know, just to mix it up. Mm -hmm. Um, g going back to this giant uh, pile of comics that showed up at your house uh, about a year ago, um, what did you think about the contemporary comic scene in general, just seeing all of that stuff? Um, it was amazing. I mean, it really, once I got, I got over being, you know, thinking like, why did I say yes? Oh, I can't do this. No. Um, once I got over that, uh, um, I was really just blown away by how rich this was and how inventive people were and how much great stuff there was and you know if i if i had had this fear at the beginning of like what if i don't like anything you know uh, um it was the opposite it was that i liked so much stuff and then we had to sort of winnow it down um and it was i i can't tell you how much i love this book and everything in it i just love the Loved it, loved the variety, um, and it was hard to choose, you know, and to say this can't be in it, but I'm going to put this in it. And but I, I think we, I, working with Bill was, you know, amazing, and so you helped a lot. Uh, no, but you had to make all those hard final choices ultimately. Uh, yes, yes, they were definitely, you know, th that's was the thing about being the guest editor, but also um, there were one or two pieces. Uh, hello. Um, there were one, one or two pieces in this book that I had put in my, you know, because what, what we did, or what I did, um, I should say, is I got, it, it was four boxes of about 30 or 35 uh, books, and I had three piles. I had yes, I had no, and I had maybe. And um, the maybe was, was pretty big, and then when I had to winnow it down, um, there were one or two pieces that Bill said, I think you should give this another look. And they, you know, one of them actually wound up being one of my favorite, if I can say I have a fav one of the favorites in the book. So it was, that was also very interesting, too, that sometimes something might not reveal itself, mm -hmm. you know, on first look, especially when you're looking at a lot of material. You know, you can just say, oh, I'm overwhelmed. This is, like, too much. I'm not understanding it. I'm going to, you know, forget it. Um, but then it might, you might actually change your mind about it, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think that's one of the, um, you know, the uh, maybe things that I'm always aware of myself going through a lot of material on a kind of 12 month annual schedule that it doesn't always leave a lot of time for rereading or something like that. And yeah. I'm always helpful to have friends sometimes who might even say to me like, oh, you should definitely look at this or this thing yeah. was really good even if you didn't like it the first time or something like that, and that's helpful. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, talk to some of the um, uh, panelists who we have here who are contributors whose work uh, Roz included in the book. Um, I'm just going alphabetically. So I'd like to um, show some work by Anne Amon. Am I saying your name correctly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Anne, the first time I saw your work was probably a few years ago. You have a website online called Comics uh, on Tumblr. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I mean, I guess I would describe it as being very short comic strips, usually featuring a character who. I assume is a kind of autobiographical or semi-autobiographical avatar type that's, character. Yeah, that's fair. Uh huh. How did you uh, start doing this? Um, well, I actually have been working on, like, when I graduated from uh, art school in 2010, I was working on like a very long children's novel, and it was like incredibly lonely, tedious work, and. I was so accustomed to having instant feedback from school and all of a sudden I was like out there alone just like writing this novel and and not feeling like I was like really connected to anybody anymore and uh, so I decided to start posting work online um, and I would and I like from the beginning I just made the work as like rough and simple as I could and like decided to not be self-conscious about it or like 
concerned with its quality, but to just like produce as much as I could. And like that was like six years ago. And my productivity has gone up and down. Like some years I made dozens and dozens of comics and some years like much fewer. But I like discovered this whole universe of people through the internet and like other comics creators and like like this huge fan base and like it was magnificent. Like I, I really I'm like a pretty like shy introverted introverted person and it was like this opportunity to like reach out to so many people. So um did you I'm just putting up one other example. Um this one felt very similar uh like very relatable to me because I Almost, whenever I go to exhibits, it's almost always like the last possible minute that yeah, you can like, same <laughs> with this one. like get into the museum. That was an exhibit that I went to like exactly the last weekend that it was open. And I just remember just kind of like shoving my way through and getting a peek at a thing here and there. Um, uh, do you, um, this thing that started out as a side project, do you consider it um, now to be important work for you or a major project I for mean, you? It's funny because like, I feel like at some point, part of me kind of doesn't consider it like super legitimate because it lives online. Mm -hmm. And like in my mind at some point, like I want to have it all together in a book. Mm -hmm. and, like, and that to me is kind of like, I wish I didn't feel that way. I wish like it was, it could live online forever and just be like, like valuable in that capacity. Um, it has become like by far like I do, I have other illustration projects and work and stuff, and this is by far like the stuff that has done the most well mm -hmm. um, of like anything that I've worked on for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And it's like probably like the mo my most recognizable stuff for mm -hmm. sure. Well, here in this room, it's probably okay to say that you value books yeah. over online things, <laughs> just looking around. This is like a temple to that idea. Um, but yeah, I was looking through your website because actually I've pretty much only seen the stuff that you've posted on that Tumblr site, but it looks like you have a large body of illustration work. I assume this is like client work? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, this is a lot of this. I actually don't do, um, like almost all my illustration work is online, which mm -hmm. is also funny, like I don't, um, like I usually get work for like websites. Um, that's like usually the jobs that I'm offered, which makes sense actually because my work lives online. Um, but that's why it's so exciting to have the opportunity to see it in print mm -hmm. um, occasionally. So, And it looks like you have, um, I, I was just kind of looking through this and I just wanted to very quickly throw up a couple of other images. You had some uh, series that seemed like maybe they were personal series. Like um, I think this one was called, was it called City People? Oh. Yeah. Or um, characters? Is this from comics. characters? Oh, yeah. I mean, actually, the this, I mean, this is my website. Uh -huh. um, so it's like my portfolio. But most of this stuff was originally posted on my comics Tumblr. Oh, okay. And then I collected it into like subgroups that mm -hmm. kind of, I felt, demonstrated some mm -hmm. like ink work aptitude or something. Yeah, so. sure. Of course. And this one, I mean, this, this reminded me uh, a, a little bit of. Um, just kind of like the type of gag panel cartoon that Roz does, all these uh, New Yorkers walking around and sharing the same kind of solipsistic thought. Um, you, you mentioned uh, wanting to work for print, and actually um, during the period uh, that we were c looking at for material for this volume, you did have uh, a print book that came out called Debbie's Inferno. Yeah. And um, you know, usually we don't talk a whole lot about like the behind the scenes uh, stories or discussions or decision making behind it, but this was actually the first thing of yours that we looked at as part of the process. And you know, one of the things that's tricky about working on Best American Comics is that it's an anthology, and it's really good for showing short pieces or excerpting really long things. But this was a piece that we, Roz, I remember, really liked a lot, but it was something like 40 pages or something like that. And it was one of those things where it's like, it feels like we can't, it's too long to run the whole thing, but it also feels like it would just be weird to yeah. like chop out a third of it or something. Like it didn't have the kind of like graphic novel structure where you could like take out a chapter or something yeah, and just drop it in. Like yeah, so that's when we went back to the Tumblr. Yeah. And I was like, well, she's got all these other short pieces, you know, and, and yeah. we ran two pieces. Uh, one of them uh, is called The Swim. This is just the first page uh, from the spread as it appears in the book. This struck me as being a little 
different from the short pieces you post on your own website. Is that be this didn't run on your site? It ran on another one. Yeah. Is that why it has a kind of different, yeah. like short fable kind of quality? Def I mean, the like on the occasions when I'm asked to like contribute something to like an anthology or like you know paying work for a website or whatever, um, I like kind of take the opportunity to try to do something slightly different than I normally would. So like I usually don't do like little autobiographical um, stuff. I kind of try to like do more of a narrative, um, just just as just because it's it requires like a lot more work and planning. Which my like four panel comics, I can literally not know how they'll end and just dash them off. And something where there's actually a narrative, I mean, you need it to be engaging, so you need it to be planned. Mm -hmm. And I don't really, I mean, I when I'm when I have a, a job like this, I would I would take a little bit more time, mm -hmm. hence like this one being more of like a, a sh little story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in some ways it's a little um, different from the work that you're most known for online, but we did include another piece that was a one-pager. Um, I don't know if people can s read that off the screen if the contrast is good enough, but this is, a, I think, a situation that probably every creative person can relate to. I mean, actually, that's like, a lot of the times when I'm trying to think of a comic to draw, sometimes I just have to sit back and be like, what am I actually feeling right now? And in, in the case of this one, I just felt really glum and kind of like I wasn't producing work and it made me feel bad. Mm -hmm. And so I drew this. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my comics kind of come out of that. Like, like I'll have an interaction with somebody and it makes me feel kind of unsettled. Mm -hmm. And then in order to kind of work through that feeling, I just draw a comic about it. Mm -hmm. And the feeling is kind of purged. Mm -hmm. Not not always, but. Yeah. Um, Roz, you've produced so much work over the years. Do you ever have days like this where you just can't? Constantly, yeah. pretty much. Uh, <laughs> it's where deadlines, de deadlines are handy for <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but on the internet, I mean, you've does having an audience give you a sense of pressure to put stuff out, even um, if you don't have a technical deadline? I mean, the longer you're, you disappear from the internet, the, I mean, you can be very quickly, I mean, your, your traffic goes down very mm -hmm. quickly. So like every time I post work, like not only do I have more readers, but I like exponentially get more and more readers and like more and more people getting in touch with me for work and things mm -hmm. like that. And like, I, I always seem to get like jobs, like art, jobs when I've been posting work regularly. Mm -hmm. Like it just reminds people that you still exist. Yeah. Um, so I really, in that sense, I would say like there is pressure. I mean, it's so, it's just nice to know that when you post something, people will see it mm -hmm. and like respond to it mm -hmm. almost every time. Mm -hmm. And that's really gratifying. Mm -hmm. so. um, Char, I wanna ask you about your work a little bit. Um, I first saw your work in a couple of uh, anthologies called Spider's Peepaw, and there were two issues of Spider's Peepaw, and I remember, especially when the first one came out, which I guess was a couple of years ago now, maybe two or three years ago, it was like, it was really felt like um, an artifact from an alien planet, <laughs> and it was like, I heard all of these rumors, like, like these are all Gary Panter students at SVA, and they like, stole color copies or something, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, it just had this whole kind of uh, aura around it and like the work look, looked like, it kind of felt like the first thing emerging from a world where like maybe people like as children had Photoshop or something like that, <laughs> you know. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what these anthologies are. Um, sure. Uh, I guess me and Ben started the anthologies together because, um, well, we were at SBA together. Gary was our teacher, and mm. he was a big influence on us, like his artwork and also just him as a person. Like he's just, I don't know, he's just really great to be around, and he tells really good stories. And um, anyways, yeah, so we started it together because we just, I guess we both had this vision in mind that we didn't see anyone making anything that was like what we had in mind, and so that's where this came from. And it's me and Ben and also um, five other people. Mm -hmm. And four of us went to SBA, but mm -hmm. the other ones didn't. OK. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you know, the, you know, one of the things that happens often with anthologies is like, you know, the, based on maybe what's on the cover or a couple of other things, it has a really 
strong uh, visual identity that people associate with the anthology, but an anthology like Best American Comics has a lot of different art styles in it. And there's definitely something that unites all this work, but you know, the covers show this like very digital art, but your work, this is from another comic that you made that was like a solo comic called Secret of the Saucers. This has like a real handmade quality too. Um, what kind of media were you um, working in when you made this comic? Um, here I was using collage and markers. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason I was using collage, well, I like using collage, but um, basically it's a true story, or it's, it's someone's real biography, um, this man, Orfeo Angelucci, who he, he truly believes that he met aliens, like, and he wrote a biography on it. And the alien, um, the way I showed the difference between the alien and the human is that the alien is made up of like collage, so he's kind of like a super, he's not human, he's like more than human. Um, so that was, that was why I used collage there. And I felt actually like, um, just even looking at Spider's Heat Paw overall, that the, even though this is very handmade and some of the other work is very digital, I felt like that collage aesthetic is kind of what unifies everything in that book. Because, I mean, digital, um, digital tools are just like made for, you know, cutting and pasting and copying and pasting and mixing and matching elements and putting photo real things next to really geometric things and scanned objects with computer generated objects. So that sense of collage seems to kind of permeate everything, I think, yeah. in the anthology. I think I, I also want to say that I love the the look of your stuff was different from anything in there and I love that, but what I really loved was how how funny it was mm -hmm. and I don't know if you can I mean some of the the lists of those we were talking about that before I think the piece that we put in here um, your the list of country Ru western oh, yeah. song the B big Rudy's cowgirls club is just a scream I mean it's <laughs> really yeah uh, I don't know, you can it's really fun to make like if you're laughing yeah. it's probably because I was laughing when I was making it oh yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it definitely uh, it was get slinky out of the stump I mean this is like I don't know why it was just really really funny that's so. all cowboy lingo yeah, like I was telling you yeah. <laughs> so yeah so these are these are from um, it's not the it's not technically the third issue of spider's peepaw but it's kind of a spider's peepaw spin-off book yeah, yeah, called yeah. Square Dance at Palms Promenade. Mm -hmm. And can you, like, from what did I understand, there are two yeah. concepts behind it. The one is that a lot of the pieces are collaborations by people yeah. who worked on the Spiders Peepaw, but there's also a concept of what the Palms Promenade is, or Square Dance at Palms Promenade is. Can you explain what the <laughs> sort of overall concept was? Um, I guess it's kind of like Square, okay, Palms Promenade, it's just kind of like a nostalgic place, maybe. Um, that's kind of like run down and I don't I don't know exactly like it was more of like a visual thing or like everybody just knew what it was but maybe we were all thinking of a different place mm -hmm. but it's a place and it's where everything in the book takes place so I guess I guess the idea was that everything in the book takes place in in Palms Promenade and then by making the book that's how you find out what the place is mm -hmm. <laughs> and there are these like fake advertisements for things in it. And yeah, it's just great. Yeah, me, me and Lauren really like doing the the fake advertisements because I think, I don't know, at least like living in New York City, walking down the street, going on the train, like advertisements. There, I almost feel like they're like invading my personal space. So I feel like this is a way to kind of talk back to it, mm -hmm. almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like, there, I mean, there's something about this that just is like fake ads in Mad Magazine or National Lampoon or something like that, too, where there's kind mm -hmm. of a tradition of like satirizing corporate culture and comic books, but the aesthetic is totally contemporary and it's very different from like an old Mad or something like that. Um, and you said, you mentioned you collaborated on the Big Rudy's Cowgirl Club with someone else who's not here. She was yeah. a lady named Lauren Poor. Yeah, my friend Lauren. Um, She's really amazing. She's like she works in all different mediums. Um, so it's really funny that she's in this book because I don't think she really considers herself like a cartoonist. But um, I don't know. She's just really inspiring to me. And when I work with her, like somehow I don't know. We're just like really playful with each other. So when we work together, or even when I'm working on my own, I always am just I have her in mind, kind of because she just has such a 
like she really has the spirit of a child like truly and it's just really fun to collaborate with her mm -hmm. um, I was looking a little bit on your website to see some of the other stuff you do because I know you work in multiple media and I was struck by these um, masks mm -hmm. uh, they're like masks of characters and one of them is a kind of like off-model Betty Boop and the others yeah. look more invented what yeah. did you what did you make these for um, well, I had been wanting to make these for a while, but uh, they ended up being for this show that was in Philadelphia. But um, basically, I don't know, I just, I love going to dollar stores. I love like Halloween and masks, and I just wanted to do my own, my own <laughs> mask. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. something about that dollar store or like Canal Street off-brand aesthetic. And actually, yeah. another thing it reminded me of was some of the stuff that Roz was sending me via email. Mm -hmm. When we were chatting about Best oh, American yeah. Comics, you were like collecting images of like, were these Japanese yeah, matchbooks? Yeah, Japanese matchbooks. Those match are so cool. Yeah, Japanese matchboxes from the 20s to the 40s in between the two world wars. And they're just advertisements for uh, everything, you know, bars, restaurants, shoe stores. They also have a lot of, I don't know if you showed any of the fake Betty Boops. Or, I, well, I have yeah. the other thing that you oh, sent me. Yeah, this is, this is the trifecta. Because you had you have your Betty Boop and your Popeye who has like a butt chin, which he does anyway, <laughs> and a really horrible Mickey Mouse, which actually the Betty the Betty Boop is very demonic, uh -huh. and and yeah. she's wearing like a Pope hat. I don't know what that is. It's, but what is this specifically? It's, it's a Manco card, and I think they were like trading cards. Uh -huh. Cards they have like sometimes uh, baseball figures or. Um, you know, just characters from movies. I uh, and and they really were fascinated by American cartoon characters, and uh, these are pretty weird. I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I love that stuff, and I I think like cartoon characters are really cool. Like especially if there's an iconic cartoon character, because then they just become part of this like universal visual language, yeah. and everyone can use them, and they, you can kind of like anyone can understand it without any words. Yeah. Like that character symbolizes something. Yeah, and I think we all sort of got creeped out by Betty Boop's head. I mean, <laughs> it's just like a very weird shape. You know? Well, she started out as a dog when she was first introduced. She was like a female bulldog. So, and her earrings were actually dog ears hanging down. It's really upsetting. So then they kind of hu humanized her, but she still has this weird kind of like poochy oh. face. Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's, I heard I heard a rumor that Aunt Fritzy was actually a prostitute. Oh, did you from hear Nancy? This? From from Na oh yeah, that's a different whole different thing. But yeah, Aunt Fritzy from Nancy uh -huh. was a prostitute because uh -huh. she always had these like men going in and out of her apartment. And yeah. Of bringing her presents, and yeah. I don't know. Yeah, maybe she's just well. That, that's a subject for another day. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. to go, go, going back to Best American Comics, yeah, one yeah. of the things <laughs> one of the things that's fun about uh, Best American Comics is you know we're always selecting from previously published work. So there's a sort of constraint where we're pulling things from a certain 12 month time period. But we do get to assign artists who are in the book to do covers and end papers. And uh, we asked Char to do the end papers. So these are, this is the first sketch that you made. Uh, this is the second sketch for the front uh, and back end papers. And I just like to really quickly show the final. So this is the front. And we have these characters and they're saying hi. And then the back and they're <laughs> going in the other direction. Can you talk just a little bit about uh, what the concept was here? Uh, yeah, well I guess at the time, um I don't know, I guess I was thinking a lot about like people mirroring each other or, well, I was thinking about what's a good way to like start and end a book. So something that kind of like will enclose the book. So like hi and bye, but also, and also I was thinking a lot about the gutter. So I want it to be symmetrical, but um, yeah. And I was thinking a lot about like people mirroring each other. Like, I guess I was worried about, um, I don't know. I was thinking a lot about like, when when you like meet someone you really like and you start mirroring their qualities and it happens by accident and yeah, I don't yeah. know how to no, explain that's great. it so yeah, much. That's great. And it really it makes I think it makes the book so friendly too. It just kind of mm -hmm. opens with you you know if you have the book with you you can look at the, just open the cover and the book says hello to you, you know. That's like a nice thing, you know. Yeah, it's like really like anthropomorphizes the whole book. Thanks. Um
And uh, I remember you mentioned, I think when we were chatting earlier, that you were hoping people would notice that it wasn't the same image on the front and the back cover. Oh, yeah. What um are you, is this like a is that like a puffy marker making the hair? Oh yeah, it is. It's a puffy paint. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have thought about, about puffy paint in a long time until I saw that image. Um, so Liana, I think I first saw your work when you published a full length graphic novel a few years ago called *A Bintel Brief*. Can you talk a little bit, just briefly, about what that book is for anyone who doesn't know about it? A, a Bintel Brief is Yiddish for a bundle of letters, and it was this, that was the name of a Yiddish advice column that ran in the Forward newspaper starting in 1906, I think. And, and my book was, I, I took some of the letters that ran in that advice column and adapted them into comics. So these are old advice letters that ran in uh, the Forward newspaper many mm -hmm. years ago that you yeah. adapted into a bunch of short pieces, basically. Yeah, very. Mm -hmm. it was, it's a very Lower East Side immigrant story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it's funny because like Roz went from doing gag panels to doing a big graphic novel type book this past year. This was the first thing I saw of yours, and now you're doing small uh, gags for the New Yorker. This is one yeah. of your New Yorker cartoons. Um, <laughs> And uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you got into doing this very specific kind of cartooning for The New Yorker. Um, I, I think my growing up has been first um, using ambition as a way to conquer writer's block and terror and then learning to destroy the ambition. <laughs> so I've been finding myself by making smaller and smaller things so is the is the big book, the Bintel Brief, the representation of that ambition to do like yeah. a giant book? Yeah, I mean it's not giant, but it's I don't know. I started with an idea instead of. <laughs> Sorry, I just put a different thing. <laughs> uh, no, but please go ahead. Yeah, I I started with an idea and and I was I was it didn't it wasn't organic, but it turned it turned into something good, and now I have the the tools I got from learning how to make a big thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that, that cat in the corner there reminds me of Saul Steinberg a little bit. Or maybe he reminds you of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, uh, did you grow up looking at The New Yorker? Was that an important um, magazine for you? Or were New Yorker cartoons important for you growing up? Yeah, well, growing up, I, I really loved kids' books, which it, it turns out were from the same world. I grew up with, with kids' books by William Steig and Maurice Sendak and Myra Kalman. And then w I think when I was about 12, we started getting The New Yorker, and I just fell in like deeply in love. Roz and Saul Steinberg were my, my two people. Mm -hmm. And, and I I've, I've wanted to do that since I, I didn't really want to make New Yorker cartoons. I wanted to be like Roz, who's, who's the, the one who's allowed to be weird. And <laughs> I wanted to be like Saul Steinberg, who did covers in a way that, that don't, don't exist anymore, mm -hmm. more kind of meta, maybe coming from, from a place that graphic designers still inhabit, but um, il illustrators know. Yeah, uh, that kind of conceptual image that Steinberg sort of perfected and that no one has really exceeded, I guess. Um, so in addition to these, these appear uh, in the New Yorker magazine. You know, we were talking earlier with Anne about social media. You also have um, an Instagram uh, that I follow and that actually a lot of people follow. It looks like 47 or more thousand people follow this. And um, I don't know if this is part of your drive to make things more and more modest, but you post a lot on the Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, you know, <laughs> if uh, these are um, sketches or ideas for things that might become gag cartoons, or if this is a totally separate process that has a life of its own for you. I, I, always, I always wish they would be like, a sketchbook to become New Yorker cartoons or something, but I always feel like I've like completed that idea. But when when I make it 
for Instagram and then I can't turn it into a cartoon anymore. I, um, Anne, Anne was a, a big inspiration for starting to do social media. Um, it's my, my favorite medium so far. Uh -huh. Instagram, specifically? Yeah, ti tiny and punchy and nothing extraneous and nothing showing off -y, not even using a scanner. Mm -hmm. So you just take phone pictures and put them right up on Instagram? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, to go back to that idea of like the sketch and the finish, Roz, I know you, as part of your process, you still send batches of sketches into the magazine yeah. each week. Do you ever have that feeling of like you got it out in the sketch and it's hard then to go back in and make a finished piece out of it? Oh, definitely. I mean, sometimes, especially, you know, when it has to do with people's facial expressions, when I'm doing a sketch, I can see the, see it in my head, and then I draw it, and then to get it for the finish is different, mm -hmm. you know, because then I'm trying to almost copy, instead of copying the feeling that's in my head, I'm copying the sketch, and I mm -hmm. have to get back to the feeling, and mm -hmm. sometimes it just takes, you know, a lot of iterations. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. um, Liana, the piece of yours that's in uh, Best American Comics this year is called All the Paintings Here Agree, and this was done for a website called The Toast. Um, did The Toast stop publication recently? I yeah, believe. yeah, The Toast is gone. Toast is toast. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It was um, wonderful. Yeah. Um, but this is uh, unusual in your work, I think, although in a way it reminded me of what you are just saying about Instagram, and that I assume it's sort of taking as its root pictures you took with your phone. It's like you made a comic, um, and this is how it appeared as a kind of long scroll on the toast, I think. And, you know, of course, for our book, we have to sort of juggle format sometimes when we're going from online to print. But you've taken, these are all images, I think, from uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's called All the Paintings Here Agree, You Are Better Off Without Him. And it's subtitled A Visit to the Museum of Modern Art After a Breakup. And you have images that are details of artwork uh, at the museum, and then you've inserted uh, word balloons on top of the characters. Uh, and I was wondering if you could just, you know, maybe say a few words about how this piece came together. So the way I, I started doing my Instagram was it it started out as drawings over photographs. They weren't photographs of paintings. They were just photographs that I took and. Uh, it it was great. It was the first, like it was this rush of feeling connected to my surroundings, which I I never do. I always feel like um, I'd like to um, hide in a body stocking if possible, but then like being able to photograph things and then like own own space by drawing on them w was amazing. And I tr I started doing the Instagram drawings instead of that because I stopped being near my. I made a decision to stop being near my computer and my drawing on the computer gear. And I, I just couldn't, um, I was using that to draw over the photographs. Mm -hmm. But this, and those were one-offs too. And, and that was how I discovered like being real, more comfortable with one-offs than with, um, with series of, and storytelling. But I am, I'm really ambitious so I, th I thought I'm going to pitch a magazine with a narrative version of this thing that I've discovered that n I'm not able to show anyone because, I don't know, nar narratives pitch better. So um, so I pitched this. It, it wasn't a pleasure to work on, but, but I think it turned out well. <laughs> I, I, was, I was dating someone who used to haunt the MoMA and and decided he was kind of the, the mascot of the MoMA in a certain way, and I decided that it was my museum, actually, which, <laughs> which m meant a bunch of things to me. Like, I, f I really, I hate the MoMA lately. I feel like I, I grew up with it. I grew up loving it. It means, like, the, the artists in there, like Matisse, mean so much to me and represent so much to me, and, and I hate crowds back to the body stocking feeling. And like it's it's such a crowded place with these like really claustrophobic escalators and you feel like there there's so much money changing hands and it's so expensive to go there. And 
I, I just, it may, like, the fact that this thing that means so much to me has changed into this other thing that suited that this no good commercial type of person who I was dating <laughs> makes me so mad. <laughs> and I was also going through a, a feminist awakening at the time, and, and it had never struck me before that all, all artists are, that, that we know of are w white men. And the harder I, like, no matter how hard I try to become like these artists, I'm never going to be like them because I'm not, not a man. So I was taking, I was trying to take back MoMA by saying that the paintings love me and don't love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, um, we've only been able to take uh, peeks at the individual work of these artists here. But I think Roz and I are both really happy that uh, so many of you who came here tonight have the book and are able, gonna be able to go home and actually read these pieces and the other pieces that are in the book. And I also hope that um, you know, if you read any of these works, you, know, you can certainly seek out more work by these artists. So we've seen all of these artists here who are with us have a lot more work, whether it's online or in print. All the artists in the book have a lot of other work uh, that's also available. Um, and I hope you, uh, you know, take the initiative to maybe follow up on any given artist who you discover in the book who you like. I think it's, it can be a great process of discovery. And if you really find someone whose work you fall in love with, you can follow them. And that's one of the pleasures of uh, liking an artist's work, that when they come out with something new, you can see uh, what they've been up to and see what they do next. Um, I just wanted, I only want to take a minute to do this. I just wanted to briefly mention, um, you know, I've been working on this book for a few years now. This is the first time this has happened, but there is one artist in the book um, who passed away while we were putting the book together. I just wanted to very briefly uh, mention her. Her name uh, was Genevieve Elverum. Uh, she signed most of her work, Genevieve Castre. She was very young. She was 35 years old. She just had a, a child, and she died of pancreatic cancer. And it was very sad for many, many reasons. Um, I was very fortunate to meet her a few times. This is just a spread uh, from her piece in the book. I kind of regret that with the projection, the image quality is always a little iffy. This is a very beautiful, delicately drawn, you know, pen and, and watercolor and colored pencil piece. Um, but it's very typical of all of her work in that she did not produce work very often, but everything that she did was really uh, exquisite and beautiful and personal. Um, I know that you know a lot of young artists struggle with figuring out how to have a career. Genevieve was very specifically the kind of person who really seemed not to think about that stuff at all and was a very pure artist. If you look at her um, bibliography, it's you know, a little piece here with this small publisher and then nothing for a few years and then a little piece there in that anthology, then nothing for a couple of years. But everything really always very beautiful and exquisite, working sometimes in comics, single images, poetry, uh, music. The one thing I just wanted to say uh, in terms of, you know, following up on the work in the book, you know, the, unfortunately, Genevieve is not, um, living anymore, won't be able to make any more work. A lot of her work, as I said, is out of print or with, you know, very hard to find. But she does have one book that was published a couple of years ago by Drawn and Quarterly called Susceptible. It's a beautiful memoir. You know, I'm not, you know, trying to put any pressure on anyone or anything, but I'm just saying that if you happen to see this piece uh, by Genevieve in the book and you like it, please at least know that there is one other um, easily available work uh, by that artist in the world. Just, I just wanted to say that because it was a sad moment in the last year. Um, another mission I'll give all of you though that's a little happier relating to Roz is that you have an exhibit that's up right now at the Museum of the City of New York. It's a huge <laughs> retrospective exhibit of your work that's up until October 16th according to the website, which I assume is correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, what was it like for you to see this huge exhibit come together that is like so much of your work from the last several years? Um, they did a really wonderful, wonderful job. It was, um, they, they had asked me to make this mural for it, which was 10 by 15 feet, and I had not painted since art school, and also I work more like 
you know, 10 by 15 inches, not 10 by 15 feet. <laughs> and even that would be sort of big. But you know how sometimes when somebody says, why don't you do this and it's not due for like months and months? You say, why not? You know, sure. And then, you know, a m month before it's due, you think that was really a bad idea. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why, why I even thought I could do this. Um, but that's, uh, this is a, a colored in version of uh, what the mural turned out to be. Um, and they did a really amazing job in um, putting it, it together. I thought, and I like the people there a lot. Okay. Great museum. Okay, great. So we have we have still uh, almost two weeks to go see this before it yeah. disappears forever. Okay, I think we have a, a few minutes left. We could take a few um, questions from the audience if anyone has any general questions about Best American Comics or questions specifically for Roz or any of the other um, people here on the panel with us today. I would love to get a, at least a couple of questions and introduce an element of interactivity before uh, the end of the evening. Okay, we have two up front, one there, and then one there. Uh, Cindy, yeah, there's a microphone coming, great. Uh, hi, uh, my question is, uh, and this has to do, I guess, with the series. Do you ever have um, uh, occasions when the guest editor uh, says besides the uh, things that you or, or the other series editors pick out, they say, oh, I also know of, you know, this, this person here from, you know, um, a foreign country that, that's really fascinating, nobody knows, yeah. you know. In other words, brings their own uh, ideas to it. Yeah, sure. Yes. Well, those are, in a way, two separate questions. The one is, if they're from a foreign country, then that probably is not going to work for Best American Comics. Technically, the series covers oh, North right. America. <laughs> right, so, but yeah, which, yeah, I mean, yeah. the, one of the counterintuitive things is that it actually, and this is true, I think, of all the Best American titles, they cover Canada and Mexico as well as the United oh, States. So it's technically the Best North American Comics. We have a lot, actually, of Canadian contributors this year, including Mark Bell, the artist who did the cover of the book, he's a Canadian artist. But so putting aside the international question, the answer is yes, there's, uh, in general, the guest editor does have the ability to pull in some work that they discovered on their own. Um, in general, what I like to do is talk to the guest editor as much as possible so that I can know if there's an artist who they're in particularly interested in or some type of work that they're looking for so that if I know I can you know, do the legwork myself. I'm perfectly happy. You know, I don't police the pool of work that hard in the sense that I'm happy to help the guest editor find things to the best of my ability uh, that they might be interested in. But yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Or if they know that, like, you don't like wizards, yeah, then, like, they don't give you, like, 50 comics that feature wizards. Yeah. Why don't you like I remember wizards? right at the beginning, uh, one of my conversations with Roz, Roz, you said you didn't like Prince Valiant or anything that looked like it. <laughs> hey, hey, yeah. <laughs> well, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so I didn't bring her Prince Valiant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, up front, there was a question there. Um, hello. Uh, so when you're picking comics, how how does this how do you go about that is there like a checklist or how do you like pick the actual comics that go into the book when you're narrowing down through all of the are you asking me or Roz uh, both, or of both? You, both of you yeah well that's a question that comes up uh, sometimes where people ask how we know we found the best American comics and there's actually no real answer to that question I think um, for me personally a lot of it just has to do with seeing so much work each year that when something has some kind of outstanding quality that distinguishes it, it sort of becomes more apparent in a way if something just doesn't look or feel like anything else that you read after you've looked at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things. Um, part of it, it, for me personally, uh, is that, you know, I'm, I think, looking to see work where the artist uh, shows some engagement with what they're doing in order to express something unique whether that it doesn't have to be uh, it could be a personal idea or it can be an idea just about form and how comics work or something like or how text and image can function or something like that those are the types of things i think i would say in very broad strokes um, that stand out to me more so than you know looking for work that's in any particular genre or visual style but someone who's I think 
credibly, something that you could show credibly is an example of all the different interesting and sometimes amazing things that you can do with comics. I'm, I'm in that, feel that way too. That, and for me, it can't just be text and image. I mean, it, there's nothing more damning to me, like when somebody says about a movie, and say, well, what did you think? They say, it looked really good. And that to me means, you know, the story did not, not work. I mean, I think one of the things that I said earlier about comics is that for me it has to, it has to have some sort of narrative and it can be a very unconventional narrative, but I think that's what kind of, uh, I think George Tro, the writer said that that structure or narrative is what keeps the reader from getting tired, you know, and it kind of keeps you going with the story. So, you know, all the, it has to have all those things and, and the individual voice, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, something about, I mean, the thing about comics is um, that there's a very low um, cost of entry just in terms of materials and things like that. It's not like yeah. film where you have to have a crew and a good, Right. equipment and things like that. Really, it's just, I mean, you can do it with pen and paper. I mean, we saw with Liana's cartoons. I mean, you can draw in a cafe and take a, a picture of it, and it's there. Um, and, uh, of, you know, so something about the individualism, I think, of the work mm -hmm. is important to me, too, um, which is not to say that there aren't successful collaborations in comics, but um, certainly we're, I think, more drawn to the individualistic expression than the kind of um, assembly line process that yeah. is behind more commercial or corporate kinds of comic books. Yeah. There's a question back there. Yes, this is for the artist. Um, how do you um, apply, if you can say that, like, to this book and how do you how was the waiting for the answer and how was like all the process of of saying this coming out i i didn't apply actually um, <laughs> well but. what happened you know it's funny because in every everyone's case is a little different um in ann's case your uh comic debbie's inferno was actually submitted by your publisher so retrofit and which is what I love when publishers do this because I don't have to go out and ask people to send me things. Retrofit just every, you know, every few months I just get a package from them in the mail with all their new stuff. Um, in the case of Char's work, um, I just happened, I think, to just see uh, the Square Dance at Palms Promenade book and buy it on my own and I liked it because I'd already seen the Spiders uh, Peepaw uh, comics before and Liana, I think you did send me your stuff. You sent me um, an email with a link to the Toast comic or maybe a PDF, I don't remember. So those are all, those are like three completely different ways of getting, um, you know, the work seen by the series editor. Um, and I don't know beyond that if people really have an expectation of waiting and seeing I mean, I think in Liana's case, you're the only person on the panel who individually submitted the work. So I don't know, maybe that's something that you could speak to, what, if getting that feedback of that the work is in the book is uh, something that you can remark on or something. I think that I was, I was I, when I was a bit younger, what, like eight years ago or something, I used to be very jealous of everyone who was in the book. And comics, comics is a, re a really good world because once you start to get to know people who make comics, you, you realize that it's very, like, very, very, very democratic and nobody like, lords it over anyone and um, everyone thinks everyone else is great. So by the time I submitted this, I knew that I knew not to take it personally if I didn't get in and I didn't think about it much. And, and I'm also submitting a lot of things all the time. And um, I, don't, I don't think it's very good to like feel like people bear you a grudge if you don't get something into something, because it makes you a worse artist. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Let's get one more. OK, there's someone in the back over there. 
When you're uh, selecting your cartoons, are you um, more uh, looking at individual works of art or entire bodies of work of an artist? If you find a single work that is amazing, are you likely to uh, include that if maybe that artist's other work isn't, if they're a one-hit wonder, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I would say, I mean, in particular, my position with all the material coming in, I mean, there's no question, I think, that if you're in any kind of role where you're receiving submissions and stuff like that, if something comes along that's the work of someone you enjoyed before as a reader, you're kind of primed to be alert and look at that. But no, there's no question. You know, I, I one of the things that I try and um, maintain in this position is a feeling that even if I haven't um, always loved someone's work before, that everyone can, everyone's work is always changing. So I have to be alert to it because I don't want to be in my position the person who like misses the boat if that artist you know makes something. And in terms of you know people who don't have bodies of work at all. We have people, I mean, there are plenty of people in the book this year whose work I had never read or seen before the material came through. I mean, so there was no, it wasn't based on any preconception about who the artist, I think one example of someone whose comics I don't think I'd read before was uh, that artist we were talking about before, Casanova Frankenstein, who did a really amazing comic called The Adventures of Tad Martin, number six, and I heard about it, and a very good friend of mine whose opinion I trust a lot told me that I really had to look at that comic. And I read it, and I thought it was great, and I sent it along with the stuff to Roz. And I'm, I would guess that you probably were not familiar with Casanova Frankenstein either. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, but it's actually incredible, and, and I'm, he's fairly obscure even within comics circles. And um, I've been very pleased to see so far that in the early reviews of the book, that piece gets mentioned pretty consistently by reviewers as one of the more memorable ones uh, in the book. I mean, I think it stands out in a way because the style is so different from everything else in the book. So it's kind of, if you're trying to very, in a shorthand, describe the variety of the work, it's helpful to point to that one. But, and I'm guessing in your case, a, a lot of the artists, because I deal with comics you're in and you're out, and a lot of the artists were people you hadn't seen before. Almost all of them. I mean, as I said, I knew the big names, you know, Chris Ware, and, but when I was looking at all these comics, I, as I said, I liked variety, um, and I just was going by a combination of the, you know, the way it, the way it looked and also the storytelling, you know, um, and I, I, I really, uh, like the book a lot. And we had one more question over here too. Yes. This is a question for Char Esme. I'm very intrigued by your name. I'm just wondering if you can give us the backstory. Uh, uh, well, my real name is Charlotte Esme Globerman. So Char Esme is just my first uh, first name and middle name, and Char is just short for Charlotte, oh, and it's just Charlotte. what I've always been called. And Charlotte just doesn't feel like when people say Charlotte, I don't turn and look. It doesn't feel like my name really. So, um, since that was a quick one, we could take one more. Is there one more person? And if not, uh, thank you all for being here today. Please join me in thanking our panelists for sharing so much with us. Also.